so all the best to everyone have a wonderful uh, uh, presentation and uh, uh, we'll start now with the first presentation and the first presentation is by shweta uh, vd0143 yes ma'am uh, yes. i will share my screen yes uh, can you just tell me what is the time allotted for video any specific instruction was given to you ma'am less than 8 minutes was what yes. was perfect. Perfect. yes perfect that's it. that's all i'm sharing yeah you can start hello everyone presenting to you our video titled lost in the sands of time an unexpected intraoperative surprise during vitrectomy following refractive surgery we do not have any financial interest a 52 year old gentleman presented to us with decreased vision in the right eye he gave past history of two refractive surgeries in the right eye many years ago he also gave history of cataract surgery in both eyes 13 years back unfortunately the patient did not have any surgical records available with him on examination the right eye showed radial corneal scars suggestive of past radial keratotomy the eye was aphakic with remnants of lens capsule noted the fundus was myopic however there were no peripheral retinal degenerations also there was no evidence of any dislocated lens in the vitreous cavity the left eye showed clear cornea with good pseudophakia and a myopic fundus just like in the right eye with no evidence of any peripheral treatable lesions since the patient was particularly saying that a lens was placed we planned for a partial lens vitrectomy to look for any dislocated lens in the vitreous cavity also considering doubtful capsular integrity we planned for a scleral fixation intraocular lens implantation So this is how the surgery went. Superior conjunctival peritomy was done and a partial thickness sclerocorneal tunnel was fashioned without entering the AC. Three standard 23 gauge pars plana ports were made. Infusion cannula was checked and started. Anterior vitrectomy was done. core vitrectomy was done and as we continued the posterior vitrectomy all the while watching out for any intraocular lens in the vitreous cavity perfluoro octane to protect the macula and to help in levitation of the lens what we see is that it does not look like a normal intraocular lens looking at the design maybe an iris claw lens let's find out an intraocular forceps was used to grasp the lens it kept escaping the grip but the endoilluminator probe helped in directing the lens and getting it towards the forceps there we go the lens was held with the intraocular forceps and brought up into the ac using the shake hand technique a dialer was used to dial the lens into the ac the previously made tunnel was opened up and the lens was explanted there it is it is an implantable collamer lens or icl and not a regular intraocular lens the pfcl was aspirated
So let's move on to the second part of the surgery. Two markings were made 180 degrees apart on the cornea. polypropylene suture was passed through the sclera the suture was docked onto a 26 kg needle to bring out through the tunnel the suture was then passed through the eyelet of the intraocular lens and taken back through the tunnel and out through the sclera procedure was repeated on the other side as well and the sutured scleral fixated intraocular lens was implanted the tunnel was closed with 10-0 monofilament nylon and conjunctiva was sutured with 7-0 Y-Gril of the tunnel were hydrated and conjunctiva was cauterized. Concluding, every vitrectomy surgery is a surprise, more so in cases where reliable history and previous surgical records are unavailable. In our patient who was already operated for cataract, how an implantable columnar lens dropped into the vitreous cavity still remains a mystery. However, the surgeon should be prepared to handle such unanticipated instances. Thank you for your patience. A very nice presentation, very well documented presentation and surgery. And uh, just want to ask you how difficult was it to dislodge that uh, lens from the retina? Because it has been there for a long time, some amount of fire, uh, additions must have been there, right? Yes, so, ma'am. So uh, basically, the implantable columnar lens was uh, ad adhered to the vitreous, but luckily it was not adhered to the retina. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was very close to the ciliary body, ma'am. That is the reason it could not be picked up in the preoperative examination. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that behind okay. the iris it was. Once the vitreous around that was cleared, it fell onto the posterior fold and that was visualized. Correct. Uh, could uh, OCT have been a useful tool to identify whether it was there or not? No, not done. In OCT. Not done. Okay. 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 You said it was a uh, exciting thing. Was it a lucky thing you said, right? That it was not adherent to the uh, underlying structures. It was only adherent to the vitreous. So who was more lucky, the surgeon or the uh, patient? Both, ma'am. Both. Uh, okay. If it was lodged to the ciliary body for a long time and if we had tried removing, it could have caused a cyclodialysis yes. or a tie could have gone into thysis because of ciliary body shutdown. On the other hand, if it was adherent to the retina, he would. It, I said it is very close to the a ciliary body. So that anteriorly clearing, uh, if there's a break, then it would have been very difficult to manage. So, so both the surgeon and the patient got lucky. I agree with you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Can I start the next video, please? Am I audible? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. Can I please start my video? Oh, ma'am. Ma can you please confirm? Okay, Sonali. Sorry, I was muted. I was going on speaking to you, thinking you are listening to me. Okay, you can start, please. Yeah, I'll share I'm your going video. To share my screen now. Yeah. Is it visible? Yes, you okay. can start. Find Nishita, an innovative approach to tackle the palsy. The surgical correction of exotropia and vertical incompetence in oculomotor nerve palsy is a daunting challenge for a strabismologist. According to the extraocular muscles in the ball, where if the are two procedures, whereas for duction short of midline, 
based on active host generation test for moderate host generation we have lr resection mr resection and for weak to low host generation based on saccharic velocity analysis transposition of lr to mr or relaxation procedures can be done in less than 100 degree saccharic velocity and lr resection mr resection for more than 100 degree saccharic velocity or a correction of vertical incompetence based on inferior rectus function a proper procedure can be chosen for the session resection of vertical recti advancement or weakening of superior and full tendon supra or infra displacement of horizontal recti in our case an 8 year old child presenting with right eye splitting and severe Is the sound clear to everyone? No, ma'am, it's breaking. Yeah, it's breaking, right? Uh, would you like to share once again quickly? Yes, I'll do that. Yeah, please do. Okay. I'm just going to re-share it. Modify so, the sheet up. Is it? Innovative approach to tackle third nerve palsy. The surgical correction of exotropia and vertical incompetence in oculomotor nerve palsy is a daunting yeah, challenge please for the strabismologist. Yeah, yeah, I'll just do that. One second. Is it audible now? Modify the sheet up. Okay, it's innovative better. Third nerve palsy. The surgical correction of exotropia and vertical incompetence in oculomotor nerve palsy is a daunting challenge for a strabismologist. It varies according to the extraocular muscles involved, where if the limitation of adduction is past midline, lateral rectus recession, medial rectus resection are useful procedures, whereas adduction short of midline. So once again, I can't hear anything. Sonali, can you just speak in the background? I think Dr. Sonali has muted herself. That's why we don't hear the video also. Okay. No, Sonali. actually, I'm able to hear the video quite clear. Okay. Uh, is it possible to play it from the admin side? Because I've already submitted the video. Ma'am, just one suggestion, ma'am. While sharing the screen, we get an option saying uh, uh, re uh, replicate the computer audio. If we click on that, the sound will be better. Yeah. Replicate the computer? I did not get to see exactly when you click on share screen, no? Two, three, yeah. one second. Just a second. I'll tell you what it is. So share sound and optimize for video clip will come. I'll just. Um, no. yes, yes. When you click on share screen. So share I should share the sound. And no, click, on the, click on those both options. Share sound okay, and optimize. Okay, okay, fine, fine. Can I play it again, please? Oh, yeah, please do, but you can start one minute a little later. Okay. Yeah. Midline. Lateral rectus recession, medial rectus resection are useful procedures, whereas for duction short of midline, based on active force generation test, for moderate force generation, we have LR recession, MR resection, and for weak to no force generation, based on saccharic velocity analysis, transposition of LR to MR, or globe fixation procedures can be done in less than 100 degrees saccharic velocity. LR recession, MR resection for more than 100 degrees saccharic velocity. For the correction of vertical incompetence, based on the inferior rectus function, an appropriate procedure can be chosen from recession, resection of vertical recti, advancement or weakening of superior oblique, and full tendon, supra or infra displacement of horizontal recti. In our case, an 8-year-old child presenting with right eye squinting and severe ptosis since birth with left face turn and reduced vision in the right eye evaluated to find a vision of 624 parts in right eye which improved to 612 after left eye patching and exotropia with hypotropia and on squint examination a 15 degree exotropia with 5 degree hypotropia was seen in right eye on Hirschberg. A right eye exotropia with left over right vertical deviation was seen on cover test and since the eye wasn't able to adduct to midline, a prism reflection test was done which showed 25 prism diopters of exotropia with 12 prism diopters of left over right deviation. The left eye findings were within normal limits, thus the child was diagnosed with congenital third nerve palsy of the right eye.
on extraocular muscle evaluation right eye showed a minus 5 limitation of superior rectus minus 4 limitation of medial rectus and minus 3 limitation of inferior rectus plus 4 movement of superior oblique and lateral rectus was seen whereas left eye was within normal limits therefore the functioning muscles of the right eye were lateral rectus, superior oblique and to some extent inferior rectus. Since the child did not have binocularity, we chose to go with surgery and a decision to spare the inferior rectus was made as the muscle would be needed for reading. The plan was to correct exotropia and hypotropia first in the right eye. In this surgery, the medial rectus was approached by a limbal conjunctival incision and plicated by 6 mm, followed by approaching the lateral rectus by a limbal conjunctival incision and its recession by 9 mm. Thus, the exotropia was corrected. To correct the hypotropia, 60 non-absorbable sutures were passed 8 mm behind the insertions of medial rectus and lateral rectus muscles and sutured in superonasal and superotemporal quadrant 10 to 12 mm from the limbus respectively. Thus, a modified Nishidas was performed, which achieved adequate alignment of the two eyes in primary gaze and the patient was orthophoric for distance and near with maintenance of the binocularity during the one-year follow-up period. To correct the severe ptosis, a frontalis sling surgery was performed after two months of squint correction by the modified Nishidas procedure, thereby giving us good results and also the child had good steropsis of up to 100 seconds of arc post-operatively. Thus, this single stage twin surgery to correct exotropia and hypotropia was found to be a simple and effective procedure with the added benefit of no ischemia of anterior segment. Also, the literature search showed that this is the first time a congenital third nerve palsy was corrected with modified Nishida's procedure. Thus, in conclusion, modified Nishida's procedure is a simple and effective technique worth bearing in mind while tackling third nerve palsy. Thank you. Yeah, a very good presentation. And uh, I think the animations were very good. Thank you. Uh, if only we had actually seen the surgical video also, it would have been much better, uh, nice for this session, right? So you didn't uh, have a record of the surgical video? Unfortunately, I did not have. So I had to go with the animation. Yeah. Yeah. But the animations were good. Good. Uh, that's all. Sorry for the delay in the in playing the video. Though. Yeah. No issues. These are all expected issues. So uh, the next video, just a minute, is by is 0145 Divya. Uh, I don't see Dr. Divya. So next is Dr. Alpesh. Alpesh is here, I think. 0146. He has two videos. You can play them one after the other. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Uh, this is Dr. Nupur Shinkre. Uh, I will be presenting on behalf of Dr. Alpesh. Okay, fine. Uh, the only uh, thing is, ma'am, uh, there is some issue with my Zoom profile. So huh? I am, uh, my video, um, as in uh, when I'm speaking and my audio is not visible from my profile. No, so no issues. Another no profile, issues. Uh, Rohit Prabhudasa. I'll be speaking through that and sharing the screen through my profile. Yeah, I can make out that. Yeah, you can go ahead. You have two videos, one after the other. Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, can I know your name, please? You said? Uh, Dr. Nup Dr. Nupur, Nupur Shinkrema. Okay. Yeah. Um, is my screen visible? Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so my topic of presentation is pseudophagic bullous keratopathy in a patient with anterior chamber implantation of a single piece PMMA PCI well. So uh, PBK refers to development of irreversible corneal edema after cataract surgery and IOL well implantation. Uh, the factors can be varied, uh, like preoperative factors such as low endothelial cell count prior to surgery, intraop factors like damage to endothelial cells from surgery, uh, or postoperative factors like postoperative uh, inflammation, glaucoma, IOL well subluxation. The average time that we see to development of PBK is somewhere around eight months to seven years from the time of surgery. So today's case is a case about a 70-year-old male who presented to a OPD with chief complaints of photophobia, redness, watering, ocular pain, and discomfort of the left eye since three months. He had history of gradual decrease in vision in the left eye since three years, and he also gave history of undergoing left eye cataract surgery 15 years back. There was no history of any systemic illnesses. So these are the examination findings. 
so in the right eye his visual acuity was 6 by 6 n6 uh, iop was 14 and uh, the fundus examination was within normal limits whereas in the left eye uh, as you can see the cornea showed a uh, uh, haze and uh, presence of uh, bullae and microcystic edema uh, there was a presence of uh, posterior chamber iol a single piece pmma iol in the which was implanted in the anterior chamber there was a pi whose patency could not be assessed and uh, the vision that the patient was giving was uh, PL accurate. The IOP was 32 millimeters of mercury and uh, the fundus examination uh, revealed a hazy view. So uh, initially we managed this patient uh, medically. Uh, a BCL was inserted in C2 and the patient was uh, managed on tablet uh, acetazolamide uh, 250 milligrams uh, four times a day for three days. Uh, uh, antibiotic steroid uh, eye drop preparation QID, uh, home eye BD, uh, 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 Topical IOP lowering agents BD, uh, sodium chloride 5% eye drops five times a day, and uh, lubricating eye drops four times a day. And the patient was reviewed seven days later and was planned for IOL explantation of the left eye under uh, guarded visual prognosis. So this was the picture after medical management. So as you can see, the cornea had cleared quite a bit. The vision was the same, and uh, the IOP had come down to 20 from 32. So this is the video of. Uh, the surgical procedure. So a temporal sclerocorneal tunnel was made. A side port was made and a visco was inserted in the anterior chamber. AC entry was made through the temporal sclerocorneal tunnel. And the IOL was just uh, dialed out. Interestingly, uh, no adhesions were found uh, between the haptic uh, and the angle structures. There was no evidence of any trabeculitis or anything uh, of that sort. And the IOL was, uh, could be explanted very easily. So intraoperatively on table, what we observed was uh, there was a vitreous blob which was uh, blocking the pupil and the uh, PI. And that was uh, in fact causing the rise in IOP. So anterior vitrectomy was performed. So the entire vitreous was cleared, uh, the blob that was blocking the pupil and the, uh, the PI. So after a good vitrectomy, uh, the AC was formed. And the case was closed. So this is the uh, picture immediately uh, post-operatively, the, immediately on the next post-operative day. The IOP had come down to 16 millimeters of mercury. Uh, the cornea was quite clear. The ex fundus examination st uh, still showed a dull glow. This is the picture three weeks post-operatively. Uh, the IOP had now further come down to 12 millimeters of mercury and the, uh, the fundus examination revealed optic atrophy. So this is the review of literature uh, wherein uh, Hara et al. in 2004 had published a study on the 10-year results of uh, anterior chamber fixation of posterior chamber intraocular lenses in which they concluded that this technique is not recommended 
as a secondary eyeball implantation procedure for aphakic eyes owing to high corneal endothelial cell loss after an average 10 year follow up uh, kuchner et al in 2014 published a study anterior chamber fixation of posterior chamber intraocular lenses a novel technique in which they developed a new technique for implantation of single piece pmma pc eyeballs in the anterior chamber after doing adequate anterior vitrectomy and creating iridectomies in the mid peripheral iris with the vitrectomy cutter at 1 o'clock and 7 o'clock positions with the haptics of the eyeball passing through the iridectomies to the uh, pc so coming to the discussion uh, as you can see the uh, design of the ac eyeball is a kelman multiplex design and uh, it aims for a four point angle fixation whereas a pc eyeball uh, has rounded haptics for in the back or sulcus placement uh the ac eyeball is anteriorly vaulted the optic is anteriorly vaulted for adequate pupillary clearance whereas uh, with regards to a pc eyeball the haptics are angulated anteriorly for pupillary clearance and close contact with pc so uh why do we say that we should not place a pc eyeball in the ac is because it can cause fibrosis of the angle structures leading to glaucoma and also the angulation of the pc eyeball makes it unsuitable for the angle if you place it the uh, with a forward angulation it can cause corneal problems whereas if you place it with a backward angulation uh, it can cause a pup pupillary block so also when you are uh, placing any eyeball in the anterior chamber you have to ensure adequate anterior vitrectomy and uh, a patent pi in patients who are planned for ac eyeballs so in this case uh, as i mentioned the culprit was the vitreous block which was blocking the pi and causing a rise in iop thereby leading to corneal decompensation and uh, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy however the presence of single piece pmma pc eyeball in the ac could have most probably contributed in the decompensation of the cornea in the long run uh, but the only interesting factor in this case was that the patient presented 15 years post operatively so uh, i would like to conclude by saying that only two studies uh, documenting ac fixation of pc eyeballs are available in literature presence of other confounding factors in the study subjects uh, makes the results non confirmative uh, long term effects have not been studied in detail hence the safety cannot be assured and uh, use of ac eyeballs or sutured or glued sf eyeballs in such cases is always preferable these are my references thank you yeah once again a very good presentation um, thank you i want to ask you ki uh, you said that uh, the haptics were not fixed and there was no evidence of trabecular uh, damage and all that yes, uh, is what is the reason for that uh um, actually it should have caused because the patient presented 15 years later but that is uh, what was interesting actually even uh, yeah. we could not ascertain why it had not happened that way But uh, uh, I feel the reason is that the eyeball is smaller, answer. right? The PC eyeball is smaller. That is smaller, but it just keeps on uh, moving in the exactly. uh, anterior chamber, Roman. Exactly. Yeah, it just That's keeps on reason. moving. Yeah. Uh, but a uh, patient presented 15 years later, mm -hmm. so that is something interesting that we found in this case. Okay. Because uh, according to us, the patient should have presented much earlier. How long have you followed this patient up after the surgery that you did? uh ma'am the patient was seen uh, a month later and now 3 uh, months later ma'am uh, okay. it's just it's it's just been 3 months since the surgery okay. and we and have not planned okay? for a secondary eyeball because uh, the patient is having optic atrophy so there's no point mm. going mm. for another mm. so it's been explained the prognosis mm. and the cornea has recovered uh cornea has recovered ma'am but uh, not uh, very clear there, mm. there are some bullae but uh, much clearer than what it was before mm. hopefully the other eye is okay Yes, ma'am. The other eye yeah. is uh, fine. It's a pseudo fakey eye uh, with yeah. a good six six vision. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Nupur. There's a Thank request you. from uh, Doctor Ar Anand. He wants to present. Is it okay? If you are okay, we can uh, have uh, his presentation. Ma'am, the second presentation uh, will be presented by Doctor Shreya on behalf of Doctor Halkesh. Okay. So, if Shreya is okay, can we have uh, Doctor Anand to present first? He has some emergency case. Yes, ma'am. No problem. I'll yeah. present later. Yeah, Doctor Anand, you can go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. Thanks to everyone. I have shared my video. Uh, I have shared my screen, ma'am. Yeah. Is it visible? Yes, it is. My my screen is visible, ma'am. Yes, it is. Yes, ma'am. The video is playing. Uh, this is just a simple video where uh, uh, normally we use uh, dialer and other instruments to prolapse the nucleus. Here I am using uh, hydro to prolapse the uh, uh, nucleus into the AC. 
as you can see the nucleus is very hard but with slight hydro it pops up into the ac and uh, after the, once it pops up uh, we can easily take it out using uh, wetpits and dialer in uh, during our pg and all we have thought we have thought uh, to use uh, uh, dialer and other thing which can damage the capsular margin but in this technique uh, i find it very easy I, I have been doing it since past 4 uh, 5 years and uh, we can almost take out any uh, any hard nucleus uh, this is a second case where uh, the nucleus is quite hard and the uh, excess is around uh, 6 to 6.5 mm and with little hydro we can uh, easily um, prolapse the nucleus into the uh, ac there is no need to use any dialer or anything to uh, prolapse the nucleus so i find this technique very uh, uh, very easy to do and uh, it, uh, i think many people must be doing this uh, technique but i thought i'll just present this uh, video so that this is a third case where i am using the similar uh, technique hydro of hydro collapse and the nucleus is quite hard with a little hydro the nucleus popped up into the anterior chamber you can keep uh, speaking about your experiences when it was difficult or when it was easy so initially uh, this is a last case uh, where you can see the excess is around 6 mm and the nucleus is quite hard it's around uh, grade 5 ns and uh, usually if we use uh, two instruments uh, or if you use uh, uh, only the dialer to prolapse the nucleus it, it sometimes it becomes very difficult and sometimes the capsular margin may also get damaged but here you can see it is very easy just with little hydro the nucleus pops up into the anterior chamber and uh, <clears throat> we have to uh, rotate the nucleus with the help of this dialer and it can be easily taken out with the help of the precision dialer initially uh, i was not using this technique i used to use a dialer and uh, two instruments sometimes it used to take lot of times and sometimes i used to you uh, one cause uh, donor dialysis also while uh, using the dialer but uh, with this hydro prolapse uh, it has been very easy since uh, past 4 5 years i have been doing it and uh, i never faced any problems with the with this technique and it is quite easy also you should but the uh, hydro which we do it should be very minimal it should not be too much just to uh, prolapse the nucleus 
if we do too much hydro then sometimes there can be uh, if, if we do forceful hydro sometimes it can lead to pc rent but uh, in my past uh, five six years experience i have never had any pc rents with this technique and i feel it is quite safe and uh, everybody can uh, use this uh, technique for uh, collapsing the nucleus especially this kind of cataracts where the nucleus is very hard even sometimes uh, even doing seco is also a little <clears throat> and it especially if cornea is compromised doing seco is also a little uh, difficult in such cases so i find this technique uh, very easy that's thank you yeah thank you that was a good uh, video and a collection of a uh, few cases of the same technique and i think every surgeon has his own style own preference and and that which can change from even patient to patient yes so you may choose to do this technique for some cases but not for all so yeah, not there are all. some things that will tell you that okay this uh, step can be used for this patient and or not yes so uh, very good. I think this is something that many surgeons have would have tried for some cases when it is difficult to prolapse in SIC. Yes. SICS. Yes. Yeah, well done. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks to all the participants for allowing me to present. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. So we go back to uh, Alpesh's second presentation. Yes, ma'am. That is 147. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, you can hear me? Yes. Sir, uh, you have to close your screen, sir. Can you please close your screen? Yeah, I am trying to close. There is some... Uh, okay. On the top bar, there will be an option. Okay, okay. I'll stop. I'll stop. Yeah, you can start, Shreya. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, good morning. Today, I'll be presenting a video of FECO emulsification of a hard leathery cataract. So, can you see, ma'am, the video screen? Yes. Okay. This is a case of a hard leathery cataract. It was done under topical anesthesia. Uh, so basically we have used a horizontal chop uh, for this technique. And uh, on the day of surgery, the pupillary dilatation was around seven millimeters uh, of the pupillary dilatation. And as we can see over here, uh, uh, with the horizontal chop technique, we are trying to divide the nucleus. In a hard cataract, uh, we have to divide the nucleus uh, around four, five to six pieces. So in a hard cataract, it is very necessary that we divide, chop the nucleus into five to six pieces so that the emulsification is easy. So uh, in this case, we had taken a uh, temporal clear corneal incision and uh, 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 the uh, capsule was stained with refined blue. A five millimeter uh, good uh, rexis was done. And uh, uh, the, in this case, we have uh, the FECO power was around 70%. The vacuum used was uh, 450, uh, 460 millimeters of mercury and the aspiration flow rate was 36 uh, uh, cc per minute. Uh, hard cataracts, uh, FACO emulsification of hard cataracts is usually considered difficult and challenging uh, because uh, in these cases, uh, the nucleus is very hard and a division into five to six pieces becomes a little difficult. And moreover, there is no epinuclear cushion uh, which will uh, protect the PC. Hence, the chances of PCR are more because in a mature cataract, the PC is thin and even the epinuclear cushion is not there. And other uh, aspect is weak zonules and mature cataract. Since uh, usually these uh, patients are old, uh, the zonules are weak. And another thing which we have to consider in cases of hard cataract is that uh, the protection of the endothelium uh, because uh, the, uh, you know, the power used is more. So adequate amount of visco has to be used. So in this video, we can see when we are cracking the nucleus, the complete epinuclear the, uh, division, uh, the cracking has to be up to, up to the level of the epinuclear plate. Whenever we are uh, move, uh, taking the chopper, uh, we have to be careful that we do not tear the rex's margin.
So once the nucleus is divided into uh, four to around four to five quadrants, the pieces can be uh, emulsified. To protect the endothelium, another consideration that can be taken is initially we have to create a crater so that there is good adequate space between the phaco probe and the endothelium. So in our case, uh, uh, in back phaco emulsification was done without any complications to the endothelium, uh, posterior capsule or any other intraocular structures like iris. So once these uh, uh, quadrants uh, uh, are divided into the pieces, each uh, the quadrants are emulsified. So once all the quadrants were emulsified, a posterior chamber uh, intraocular lens was implanted, foldable lens was in, uh, implanted. So phaco emulsification in a hard leathery cataract is safe provided a proper technique and uh, appropriate technology with proper power uh, modulation and enhanced fluidics if used in a proper way. Phaco emulsification is safe in hard leathery cataracts. Yeah, very nice presentation Shreya. Uh, or hard cataracts are always so challenging and uh, the cataract that you showed is a quite uh, leathery hard cataract so yes. I'm sure it must have been a very challenging case and did you anticipate that this would go as you as it went before surgery? Uh, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, just want to tell this case was done by Dr. Alpesh Toprani, ma'am, and his uh, trainee. So okay. he, he, it is his case. So you, uh, in a heart cataract, it is always challenging and uh, complications are expected, especially PCR, since uh, the posterior capsule is very thin. Uh, but uh, uh, since uh, sir is doing these cases, it must be, it is easy for him. What about FACO time? How much was the FACO time? Ma'am, the CD, it was done, uh, uh, Legion Alcon machine, the CD was 26.9, ma'am. Okay. And how was the cornea? Cornea was clear, ma'am. Next post of the clear. That is okay. what uh, I wanted to give a take-home message with this video, that with the use of power, uh, good model, power modulation and fluidics, uh, it is safe to do uh, phaco emulsification in hard leathery cataracts without any damage to the endothelium or the PC. Because in this case, the next day the co cornea was clear. There was no, uh, there were no corneal haze. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So we can move now to the next presentation. Uh, the next is by Tiger. No. <laughs> One for eight. <laughs> yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. Priyanka. Dr. Priyanka. Yes. Priyanka. Uh, my internet is slightly unstable, ma'am. In case it goes off, I'll definitely log in again and present. Sorry. Sure. We'll hope. You can put off your video so that uh, the bandwidth will be maintained. Uh, okay. So that will help. Okay. Uh, so very good morning, everyone. I'll present this case. I'm a fellow at the Retina Institute of Karnataka. My case is about a 23-year-old gentleman who came with diminution of vision, which he noted two weeks back uh, following an accidental trauma to the left eye with a ball. He had no systemic illness and no other relevant family history. On examination, right eye visual acuity was 6.6, left eye was 6.60, and uh, there was a dull yellow glow on the fundus. Right eye fundus evaluation was normal with a normal disc macula and periphery. Left eye showed a lot of exudative detachment, telangiectasia, and a peripheral BPTR in the inferotemporal periphery. So we made a diagnosis of Coates disease. We can see the OCTB scan showing the exudative detachment with a lot of exudates. So patient uh, underwent uh, cryotherapy along with external SRF drainage, and we also gave intravit uh, ranibizumab to the patient. Following this, uh, patient's SRF had definitely come down and patient was doing well. He was maintaining 6 by 60 vision and we did some more peripheral laser near the VPTR, which, which is seen here. Uh, and it was uh, slightly shrinking now, post-laser. And the SRF was also reducing. 
Uh, four months later, he again came to us with a drop in vision to hand movements. We see that the detachment had increased and there was a large subretinal band which was preventing the attachment of retina. We gave another attempt of external SRF drainage along with cryotherapy, but the retina was not settling. And the, as we can see in the OCT B scan images, we can see the subretinal bands which are preventing the retina from attaching. So finally, we advised the patient for uh, vitrectomy. I'll show the video. So after doing adequate uh, core vitrectomy, the peripheral VPTR was tackled by clearing all the vitreous near the VPTR. And uh, knowing the fact that there was a lot of anterior hyaluronic proliferation, uh, we were very careful in achieving adequate hemostasis. As we can see in this image, there is a thick vasculature running in the anterior hyaluronic very close to the VPTR. Now the next problem at hand were the large subretinal bands which were preventing the attachment of retina. So we made a temporal retinotomy in such a manner so as to bring out all the subretinal bands from single retinotomy. It was a large interlacing band of subretinal uh, bands. So here we are pulling it out of the retinotomy. We were lucky to have found a good site uh, and we caught uh, almost all of them through the same retinotomy, which was made just temporal to the fovea. Now, as uh, many of us must be thinking that we will tackle this uh, with a vitrector, but uh, the material was very tough. We also tried uh, tackling it with the vitrector, but uh, it was amenable to the vitrector. It didn't uh, respond at all. So that's the large subretinal band we can see the network. And this was our failed attempt to tackle it using a vitrector. It did not uh, respond. So we enlarged the sclerotomy wound. And with a bimanual approach, we brought out the subretinal band through the enlarged sclerotomy. So this is the place where we are catching the tiger by its tail and pulling it out. I think this is by far the largest subretinal band which uh, we have encountered. The retina was flat under oil and retinotomy was lasered. This is the post-op one month result. The patient is maintaining three by 60 vision under oil. We can see retina is nicely attached. None of the subretinal bands are seen now. This was the pre-op OCT. So this uh, through meticulous surgery, which was done by Dr. Mulidhar sir, uh, we were able to tame the tiger. Thank you very much. Mm. Excellent, excellent. Such a huge uh, sub band that was, must have been really challenging to yes. take it out also. Yes. A very nice presentation. And do you have a follow-up detail of this patient? Uh, he's uh, stable with three by 60 under oil, ma'am. Uh, it's okay. three months now. Okay. okay. Uh, we are not planning to remove the oil now. Okay, okay. Yes. that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So we move on to the next presentation. Next presentation is by Shweta, 149. Hello everyone, presenting to you a case of a 28 year old gentleman who came to us with blurred vision following a history of trauma to the left eye with stone 10 days ago. His presenting visual equity was 66 and N6. He had consulted elsewhere, was told to have bleeding in the eye and was advised conservative management. At presentation with us, he had an inferior vitreous hemorrhage in the left eye with a metallic intraocular foreign body which was noted in temporal retina. In view of retained intraocular foreign body, we posted him for an emergency parsplena vitrectomy and foreign body removal. The patient was shifted and was given a peribulbar block. After block in OT, oops, intraocular magnet is not available. So what next? A little flashback into the childhood gave us an idea. 
As kids, we would have played with magnets and experimented with them. Temporarily, transferring the magnetic property to non-magnetic metallic objects would have been a child's game back then. We thought if we can use this property in our case today. We called the biomedical team and requested for a magnet. Here it is. We took a metallic scissor and tried to magnetize it temporarily. And it worked. We tried similar thing on a MVR, MVR plate. this work too. So magnetization is the property by which a metallic substance attains magnetism temporarily or permanently. Ferromagnetic substances like cobalt, nickel or iron containing substances can be magnetized by saturating that is aligning all the magnetic domains in one direction. So magnetism occurs when negative and positive particles in an object line up in a specific manner. We can use two magnets as shown in this video or just one to magnetize a metallic substance. The north pole of the magnet has to be rubbed against the metal multiple times in the same direction. This helps in aligning the particles and magnetizes the metal. Like you can see in this picture, the iron nails get attracted to the steel bar which has acquired magnetism. Another demonstration of the same technique. Uh, we had another doubt, will this magnetism work through a sterile covering? Again, the childhood game reminded us that it will. We put a general purpose magnet in a sterile plastic glove, covered it well and took an intraocular forceps and tried to magnetize it by gently stroking it over the magnet multiple times in the same direction. We also magnetized an MVR blade in the same direction. And then we proceeded with the surgery. Three standard 23 gauge parsnana ports were made. Anterior and core vitrectomy was done. The pouring body was visualized and the vitreous around it was cleared. You can see the foreign body being freed up from the surrounding vitreous additions. PVD induction was done with assistance of triamcinolone acetonide. PFCL was injected to protect the macula. And with the help of our magnetized intraocular forceps, the foreign body is being lifted and brought up. The foreign body was delivered transclerally by extending the port entry that we had previously made using an MBR blade. Here comes our foreign body which has been removed totally by using a DIY foreign body magnet removal forceps. of one month, patient was doing well and has a silicone oil filled dye with well attached retina. Silicone oil was put in view of an inferior break which was lasered. Best guided visual acuity has been 66. So this is how we tidied over the crisis with an indigenous idea. Take home message. In the absence of intraocular magnets, instruments like intraocular forceps, 
MVR blade or with a tummy cutter made of ferromagnetic alloys can be magnetized, sterilized and utilized for intraocular foreign body removal. On table magnetization can be achieved using magnet in a sterile plastic glove like weighted and the desired instrument can be magnetized. Creativity and logical thinking can solve even the seemingly most difficult problems and where there is will, there is always a way. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, almost felt like a movie where you're telling a story to all of us. That was very nice. And the DIY was very uh, good idea. Do you, have you done that many times after that or before that have you done? Or this was one odd uh, case wherein you did that? Time, it was one odd time. And we always had an intraocular magnet. Uh, some renovation of the OT happened. Some instruments were sent for condemn and intraocular magnet was lost. And it was realized only after the patient was blocked. Uh, okay. But uh, another center of our institute, Shankara Guntur branch, one consultant had tried something like this. So um, based on his experience, uh, we tried this for the first time. One more time after this incident happened, uh, recently we have indented a magnet now, but still we used the forceps, uh, magnetized the forceps and used it for additional support. Okay. Okay. Uh, have you published this or any public uh, published data is available on this? There's no published data available, ma'am. Uh, mm -hmm. We are trying to publish it. Okay. I think you should. And uh, that's what uh, our patients will never know the effort and the dedication that we put in to give that uh, six by six vision in the most difficult cases. Correct. Thank you. Well presented. Thank you. Yeah, so we now go to the next one. Uh, that is 150, Sheriff Ali. An ocular biopsy is an invaluable tool in the armamentarium of an ocular oncologist. It is a procedure in which tissue is surgically removed from the eye to examine under the microscope for a definitive diagnosis, thus providing a clinical pathological correlation. This helps in obtaining a diagnosis, which provides a basis of treatment plan for the patient. Through the years, ophthalmic pathology has added value to the practice of ophthalmology by structurally defining and understanding ophthalmic disease processes. An ophthalmologist and especially an ocular oncologist encounters an array of lesions involving the eyelids, conjunctiva, sclera, orbit and intraocular structures. Ocular tumors, benign or malignant, are classified according to the cell of origin and their location. A thorough clinical examination provides a clue about the provisional diagnosis. It is important to look for the telltale signs that can differentiate benign neoplasms from malignant entities. Lethal malignant tumors can masquerade as inflammation or benign lesions. Any doubtful tumor must undergo a biopsy for a definitive diagnosis, thus avoiding misdiagnosis. Mostly, tumors are reliably diagnosed based on clinical <coughs> evaluation aided by diagnostic techniques. However, for accurately diagnosing tumors, biopsy is required. The role of the biopsy can be therapeutic or diagnostic. Small tumors amenable to complete resection can help relieve the patient of the disease through complete excision. Larger lesions when excised require appropriate reconstruction. <coughs> Diffuse lesions may require incision biopsy with or without debulking for providing the diagnosis and further planning the course of management. The choice of biopsy depends on lesion characteristics, possible diagnosis, location and surgeon preference. In incision biopsy, only a part of the lesion, including superficial and deepest part, is removed for histological examination. Punch biopsy is a quick and simple diagnostic procedure that requires minimal equipment and can be performed as an outpatient procedure. 
In excision biopsy, the entire lesion is removed and subjected to histopathological examination for definitive diagnosis. For intraocular tumors, fine needle aspiration biopsy either transcleral using a 26 gauge needle or transocular using a vitreous cutter can provide a tumor sample for diagnosis. Aquastap can help in investigating neoplasms mimicking anterior uveitis or intraocular infections. A tumor containing eye where prospects for restoring vision are small or where risk of tumor spread to adjacent structures is present and enucleation or accentuation might be required. In case of a clinically benign looking lesion, simple excision without taking margins of healthy tissue will suffice. In case of suspected malignant lesion, as a standard of care, tumors are excised with at least 4 mm margin while awaiting histological confirmation of tumor-free margins for appropriate reconstruction. Intraoperative diagnosis of margin clearance is achieved either by a frozen section or Mohs micrographic surgery. We prefer frozen section to Mohs micrographic surgery. In case of ocular surface lesions with intraepithelial spread known as pagetoid spread, a MAP biopsy must be performed. A close collaboration and open communication at every step between the ophthalmic surgeon and an ophthalmic pathologist is mandatory for accurate reporting to guide the management. The ocular specimen collected undergoes three phases. Pre-analytical stage starts with a thorough pre-surgical planning for all the lesions. Multiple specimen from different sites must be placed in separate bottles. Specimen orientation is required so as to ensure that the pathologist can report the margin of excision accurately. To prevent curling up of an ocular surface specimen, the specimen should be placed on Wattman filter paper before placing into fixatives for proper embedding and processing. In case of conjunctival map biopsies, the precise location of the sample must be marked and numbered for accurate identification. A thoroughly filled ophthalmic pathology request form must be submitted with each specimen. Routine surgical specimens are fixed in standard 10% phosphate buffered formalin in a leak-proof container. Tissues are fixed to preserve and prevent decay and maintain a lifelike structure. Gross examination of the tissue is done as the first step, following which the tissue is fixed. The length of processing depends on the size and density of the tissue being processed, which can take from several hours to overnight. Buffered stain solution are used to highlight different structures. Frozen section allows rapid diagnosis of the fresh tissue. Tissue morphology may be compromised, but process is quick and can give a rapid diagnosis which is required in aggressive tumors where margin clearance is required before planning reconstruction. A thorough understanding of the pathology report requires knowledge of the normal histology of the ocular structures. Once we have a thorough understanding of the normal, the abnormal can be adequately diagnosed. This diagnosis becomes a cornerstone for what the approach of treatment for the patient will be. Sometimes as an adjunct to the routine histology, immunohistochemistry is required to confirm, classify, stage and prognosticate a tumor. Immunohistochemistry is a powerful laboratory technique that involves staining tissues with antibodies directed at a specific antigen expressed in certain types of cells. Aside from its utilization in diagnosis, immunohistochemical staining has increasing applications as a prognostic marker and guide for therapy. Conventional histopathology is rapidly shifting towards digitalization. The partnership of ocular oncology and pathology allows for the seamless integration of diagnostic services, therapeutics, and clinical research, thus providing patients with optimal comprehensive care.
Yeah. Uh, so, ma'am, through this video, actually, I just wanted to uh, highlight the importance of uh, the teamwork that goes on to managing a patient because many of us, like most of us, know obviously the protocols according to how the uh, section should be done, excision should be done, but we don't know the journey of the sample in the pathology lab, and there can be so much of miscommunication with the pathologist and everyone. So, just to get a good uh, like from the pre-analytical stage to till the time the case is reported and the treatment of the patient, actually we should keep ourselves in the loop because ultimately whatever you put in the basket and how we treat the patient actually matters. So that's why we just wanted to yeah. put across this general video uh, just for uh, this, uh, this knowledge for everyone. Uh, I think you shouldn't uh, say just for that. It was a wonderful <laughs> video. And uh, it says a lot about uh, how... Uh, the tissues go through different phases before they become a diagnosis. So, and how I think it's a very good. Also, uh, like many many a times, there's a miscommunication. Frozen samples can be sent in formalin, which should not never be done. Like all of those things. So, just to know exactly, exactly how to send the sample to the lab, which is like so very important that it never generally gets discussed. And uh, so that's why we just want yeah. to put. So again, don't say just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was a very good overview i think it's a good educational uh, video and you should uh, i think present it in more uh, fora like this even as an instructional course you, you could include this uh, as an instructional course so that everyone knows about how to do the small things about it thank you so much uh, next we have anisha 152 I think we move to Tulsi. Tulsi is here, 153. Uh, yes, ma'am, I'm here. Uh, can yeah. I just take a minute? Uh, there's some technical glitch. I'll just be back. I'm okay. just trying to uh, share the screen. Okay. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, if anybody else is ready, I can present the next one. Sure. Time. So we go to... I'll present uh, this after this. Amulya 154. Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Yeah, so please see? present. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, is it visible? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, good morning. So the video I'm presenting today is about a technique called the continuous control in a continuous curvy linear capsular axis in a hypermature cataract. So this is a small incision cataract surgery of a patient who, uh, with intumescent or hypermature cataract. So a 5.5 inc uh, mm incision was made and a tunnel was created. Then uh, air bubble drip in blue was injected. Then it was, uh, um, then viscoelastic was injected just to uh, maintain the anterior chamber. So is there um, a problem? Yeah. Uh, article. So we got it. Uh, so uh, this is a study by Figuardo et al. So they advocated the concept of a pressurized intralenticular compartment. So they're saying that there is an anterior and posterior intra, uh, pressurized intralenticular compartments. So when we puncture the anterior uh, lent, uh, lenticular, I mean, anterior capsule, the uh, intralenticular pressure of the anterior, um, uh, the anterior part of the lens becomes equal with that of the anterior chamber. So uh, it, thereby the posterior intralenticular pressure, um, like you can see here, I'll just show it to you. Here, um, sorry. So this is the lens and this is the anterior intralenticular pressure and posterior intralenticular pressure, which is held together by E, which is the equatorial block. So uh, they said that when uh, one, when you make a nick in the anterior capsule, uh, the posterior intralenticular pressure still push, push uh, is still there and it pushes the lens upward, thereby um, expanding the rexis. So this is the technique behind the, I mean, this is the reason behind anterior, uh, I mean, Argentinian flag sign. So they, in their technique, they made two um, capsular rexis, that is one mini capsular rexis of 3.5 mm. And then they aspirated the uh, uh, cortical liquefied cortex. And also they used, and uh, then after that, they um, e extended the rexis. So in our study, we used a new technique where we use a cystitome uh, and the cystitome is attached to a drip set, which is attached to normal saline. So we let drop by drop, uh, we use drop by drop irrigation um, after, making the, uh, after making a nick on the anterior capsule so that the, in, a, in a controlled manner, the um, cort liquefied cortex is egressed out. In another study by, um, in another study by, uh, Chan et al. They used a 27 gauge needle to aspirate cortical matter from the uh, by, through a paracentesis. But in our study, we allowed drop by drop irrigation so that there is a control manner of 
removal of the liquefied cortex and uh, and decompressing anterior interventricular compartment so uh, in another in one more study by mahalingam and sambhav so they said they used a phaco tip to puncture the anterior capsule and debulk the lens matter but uh, since so this is a SICS study. Um, we've used a cystotome, and also the same cystotome uh, is used to um, make the continuous curvilinear capsular exit. So here you can see that the cortical liquefied cortex is egressing out because of the uh, drop by drop uh, of um, irrigation that we've used. And one more study that we've uh, uh, taken some tips from is uh, a study by Monica et al. So if uh, uh, this was done in PGI, uh, Chandigarh. So they used a functionally closed uh, anterior chamber with a, a 2 mm main port incision and a 30 gauge needle was inserted through that and uh, cortical mass matter was aspirated. So they used a tipping technique of the um, nucleus. So uh, to decompress the posterior intralenticular compartment as well. And, visco, and, uh, and they used excess visco to flatten the anterior capsule post uh, decompressing the intralenticular compartments and then carried on with the continuous curvilinear capsular excess. So, uh, uh, by, but using extra vis uh, visco can cause, uh, um, uh, can cause complications so uh, like reverse argentinian flag sign this is a uh, this has been uh, advocated by uh, bharadwaj so they uh, say that um, so we all know about the argentinian flag sign it is because of the intralenticular pressure which is ca uh, which is ca uh, causing runaway of the rectus but they say that um, in overfill of the visco into the anterior chamber work can cause um, like ex uh, runaway of the rectus once you make a nick on the um, once you make a nick on the anterior capsule. So to avoid this also, we uh, we didn't, we just use enough visco to avoid this. We didn't uh, overfill the um, uh, thing, the um, anterior chamber with excess visco. So this is the picture just de depicting the reverse Argentinian flag sign. Then uh, like, like I said earlier in our study, we used the tipping of the nucleus to decompress the um, um, posterior interlenticular um, compartment as well to avoid Argentinian flag sign, and then the uh, and we um, then we in injected just enough visco to form the anterior uh, capsule to avoid um, reverse Argentinian flag sign. So in one more study, they had uh, uh, by soon psych, they said uh, they spoke about a technique called the capsular milking technique, where they used a uh, visco adaptive uh, to a visco adaptive helon five to uh, like uh, place over the anterior capsule, and then they used a sweeping movements of with the same visco adaptive cannula from peripheral to the uh, center where the incision was made to uh, milk the capsular bag to remove the liquefied cortex. But um, it can lead to complications like zonular descent. So we avoided this technique. So we we uh, carried out the ca continuous curvilinear capsular excess using the same cystitome, uh, by with uh, still drop by drop irrigation from the uh, drip set. And uh, this removed the residual cortex which was there in the capsular bag. So the advantages of uh, this technique um, is that since we're using a drop by drop irrigation, we're avoiding uh, the, the vision, the uh, anterior chamber is clear of the liquefied cortex. So the uh, visual, it, the you're able to see the lens uh, clearly and the anterior capsule also clearly. One, the second is that the surgeon has control over the rexis. Uh, so there is no runway of the rexis that thereby uh, avoiding Argentinian flag sign. Then, um, um, to avoid, we also avoided reverse Argentinian flag sign by using just enough visco to fill the anterior chamber. Then uh, this helps tackle the difficulties that are faced with the intumescent cataract or uh, hypermature cataracts. So, and there's also no um, need for any other uh, instruments, and it's also cost effective. Thank you. Yeah, very nice uh, demonstration of the method, as well as a very good. Uh, demonstration of the animations and uh, the different pictures that you showed to demonstrate how the pressures uh, can affect the uh, capsulotomy. Very well presented. I would just have one question for you, I have, and that is, if it happens, what next? <laughs> um, and then we... <laughs> uh, prevention is always better than... We convert it. We convert it to capsulotomy yeah. and 
try to yes uh, yes yes and i think during the covid time where many patients could not access health care at least i have seen more number of uh, mature hypermature cataracts and on table there was always this fear of getting this argentinian assignment yes and uh, yeah we saw many after the covid uh, period after the first lockdown especially yes. so many cases one after the other come with hypermature cataract and uh, yeah very good Thank very you. good so we move to the next one uh, so amulya finished right yes now i finished yeah 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 so um, anand also has finished i think now we move to anusha again 157 anusha okay uh, tulsi are you ready now uh, yes ma'am yes ma okay tulsi can present now oh uh, ma'am am i audible yes yes okay uh, this can i my screen is visible now yes The authors have no financial interest in the subject matter of this video. Laser refractive surgery began in the late 1980s. Eczema laser ablation changes corneal asphericity index along with increase in spherical aberrations. Back then, refractive surgery was still evolving. Surgery is done in early years when the normogram was still being revised and broad beam lasers were being used resulted in irregular corneas due to decentered ablation small ablation zones and central islands Let us now see a similar case of a 54 year old male who underwent lasik 20 years ago and is now presenting with blurring of vision and persistent glare bellix i need to get this fixed anoramix can you fix my problems let me have a closer look on evaluation his best corrected visual acuity was plain on 2040 corneal topography showed decentered ablation and slit lamp examination was suggestive of grade 2 nuclear sclerosis cataract sure we can so druids what should be our approach in such cases ion power calculation in such cases has always been challenging for cataract surgeons A quick review of literature suggests that there are higher chances of refractive surprises occurring because of errors in keratometry measurement and inherent errors of the IOL formulae. How do we ensure good outcomes in such cases? Our previous work showed that surface regularization in such irregular corneas ensures predictable outcomes after cataract surgery. We hereby describe an algorithm for topo guided corneal customization prior to cataract surgery the C3 algorithm Using the wavelight topography guided customized ablation treatment software the first step is to set a valid Q value keeping in mind that making the Q value more negative increases the spherical aberration or c12 using the topographical neutralization technique and setting the modified refraction to zero we check the defocus that is c4 and spherical aberration that is c12 our aim is to equalize the c4 and c12 In this case, adding a myopic correction helps equalize the C4 and C12. Adding this compensated refraction to the patient's acceptance gives us the final par to be treated. After correcting the corneal irregularity and ensuring stability of the EKR K readings over three consecutive follow-ups, our next step is to calculate the IOL power 
using the ASCRS post-refractive surgery calculator. The appropriate values are added from the EKR map An IOL power chosen is the minimum power obtained on the calculator. The next question is which type of IOL should we choose? It is suitable to implant aspheric IOLs in such cases depending upon the type of ablation they have undergone. In hyperopic laser ablation, we choose an IOL with a positive spherical aberration. And for myopic laser ablation, we choose an IOL with negative spherical aberration. Coming back to our case, an 18 diopter IOL with negative spherical aberration was implanted and the patient had best corrected visual acuity of 2020. To summarize, in post refractive surgery for eyes with regular corneas, IOL power is directly calculated using the ASCRS calculator. In those with irregular cornea, a preferred approach would be to regularize the cornea using topo-guided customized ablation treatment. Our novel strategy is thus a safe and effective way of optimizing results in such cases. Nice. Any closing comments? Um, nothing really, ma'am. I think the video was self-explanatory. Sorry? Uh, can you hear Couldn't me? Couldn't hear you. Yeah. Uh, hello? Yeah. Any closing comments I wanted to know? Uh, nothing, ma'am. I think uh, uh, the video has told everything. Everything. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. That's nice. Uh, actually, AI is now taking over in many fields, including yes. uh, surgeries. That's yes. very wonderful. Thank you. Uh, it was a good presentation. Thank you. So we now have very little time. So we'll go ahead with the next presentation. And that is by uh, Anusha. Uh, 157. Is she here? I don't see her here. Uh, Nayana, 158 is also not here. Then Anisha 152, not here. And one more is Divya 145. Uh, none of them are here. So any presentations left here? No? Okay, that's it. I think... Uh, then I could have asked some questions to her. I thought there are four or five more questions, uh, presentations, so I didn't ask her anything. Then uh, fine, uh, the session went off very well. And many of the uh, videos were very impressive, particularly the surgical videos, uh, well documented, well recorded and well presented. The animations part, I was very impressed. Uh, the use of uh, animations in order to explain what you have done was a wonderful thing to see and learn and thank you so much everyone uh, with that we move ahead i think there'll be another session following this goodbye have a good day bye thank you ma'am thank you all thank you all so saujanya i'm just sending the report that four of them have not presented they were not okay. here okay thank okay. you thank, thank you. you then bye